I'm going to go out on a limb this morning and say that if all you ever read in your Bibles were the first chapter, Genesis 1, the very first chapter of the Bible, and the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 21, and now, now you know why I went out on a limb because I don't want you going out thinking that's the only thing in the Bible you need to read. I'm just saying if all you read was Genesis 1 on the front end, Revelation 21 on the back end. There are some ways in which you will know everything you need to know about God. Simply put, God is a dreamer. God is a dreamer who once asked him herself, before anything existed, what if I took absolutely nothing and made something from it? That's a dreamer, folks. That's a dreamer. That's not the human experience at all. We can make things, but we need to start with something. God dreamed about making something out of nothing. Think about that. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Those are the very first words in our Bible. Formless void and total darkness. Friends, that's nothing. Absolutely nothing. And out of this, God thought and said that something that never existed before could be made. God's not just a dreamer. God's an artist. God looked at nothing and said something with meaning could come and that something with purpose would come into being. That's amazing stuff. It's, it's out there on the fringes of doing philosophy, thinking thoughts that we never thought before. You know, my son and my daughter-in-law are artists. They're graphic designers. They're artists. And their jobs are to listen to someone's idea and make that idea visible, tangible, and meaningful. And because they are our family, Ruth and I often get pro bono stuff out of them occasionally. That's, that's nice to have artists in the family who will do that for you. And it always amazes me because it's usually by text or by a telephone call, I'll get in touch with my son or get in touch with both of them and tell them what my idea is. I need a logo for something. I need this for an organization I'm related to. And with just very little description about what the organization does and what we're intending to say, they come up with something. They come up with something that depicts what I was talking about and goes even deeper and depicts things I never even thought about. And whatever it is, the artistic expression they come up with has all kinds of things they now need to explain to me. All the inside deeper meaning that go with that logo. It's amazing to behold. And when you're not an artist, it's mind-blowing stuff. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a verbal person. If I can't do it with words, I can't do it. And yet, these artists in our family can do amazing stuff without words. So God spoke words and concepts that no one had ever expressed before. And no one ever expressed them because there was no one to do that at the time. But he expressed words and concepts and they became something visible, tangible, meaningful. God said, let there be light. 
Now, if we had been there at the moment when God said, let there be light, we would have said, okay, God, what's light? Then God said, let there be sky and let there be dry land below. And we would say, what is that? And the same when he said, let there be sun and moon and stars and day and night. We wouldn't have a clue. And then God would go on and say, let there be swarms of living creatures and birds. Let there be birds. And we'd say, calm down, God. I don't understand any of this. And then God would say, let there be cattle and creeping things. What's a creeping thing, God? I don't know what you're talking about. And let there be wild animals. And let there be humans. Well, what are those? Oh, you'll be sorry, God, if you make those. God, I don't know what you're talking about. But have at it. Have at it. You're the dreamer. You're the artist. You're the one who knows. Genesis chapter 1 is the poetic telling of the dreams that were in the divine artist's mind and only in the divine artist's mind before there was anything at all. Then God spoke it into being. And then God did an unusual thing after speaking into being. This whole creation that God came up with, with all these thoughts and concepts that he spoke into being, at the very end, what did God do with it? The artist, the divine artist, he handed it over to the care of the very creation he had just come up with. That's amazing. Imagine for a moment you have decided to commission a piece of art and you have paid a lot of money for it. You've talked to the artist and you've explained to the artist what you're looking for and what you want created. You describe it all. And then the artist brings it to life in a way you couldn't have ever imagined and you're so happy and it is so magnificent and you pay for it and you take it home because now it's yours. But even so, there's a sense in which it really isn't yours. Yeah, you paid for it. Yes, you have possession of it. But all you did was bring it home. In a way, it's always going to be the artist's. For it's the artist's spirit. It's the artist's soul. It's the artist's creative energy and ideas that went into making it what it is. And you can't do that. All you can do is hold it after the fact and admire it. It's always going to be the artist's in that sense. But, as I said, you bought it. It's legally yours. And you can take a hammer to it if you want to. But even so, it did come from the artist and from the very depth of the artist's soul and mind. You know, there are 66 books in the Bible. You should all know that from Sunday school, right? There are 66 books of the Bible, which means there are hundreds upon hundreds of chapters with stories that take place over thousands of years. And after the very first chapter that I mentioned where God created it all out of a dream, we get to Genesis 2 and we get to the nitty-gritty of it all after everything is now in existence. We get to Genesis 2 and what do we get? We get a story of human deception. We get a story of humans in need to control everything no matter what. And by the time we get to Genesis 3, what do we have? A murder between two brothers. And beyond that, for the chapters that follow, we have human conquest over humans. We have stories of enslavement. We have stories of tribal warfare and kingly warfare and corruption and class favoritism. And then we have emperors of mighty empires who, be who begin to believe that they're God. 
this creation, this dream that was in the divine artist's mind, somehow terribly went awry. And there are hundreds and hundreds of chapters telling about that between Genesis 1 and the last chapter. God knew this. God grieved over it. And then God dreamed a new dream. But you see, us, we humans, we treated this piece of art like that person who buys that expensive piece from an artist and then takes a hammer to it. That's what we did. But as I said, the dreamer never stopped dreaming. And the dreamer dreamed of something that we never heard of before. Redemption. Something new. It's like the artist saying, I will go to the patron and I will offer my very best creation even after he destroyed what I made for him the first time. I will give him a redeemer to make his art pure. But he sent that redeemer. The divine artist did. And it was like taking a hammer to it all over again. That is specifically a hammer, nails, and wood. But the dreamer didn't stop dreaming and dreamt of something beyond redemption. He called it resurrection. And the last chapter of this book, after all the tragic behavior of the past, tells us this. The home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Those are the words of the last chapter in our Bibles. And what does that mean for us? God will not let our human destructive behavior ever be the last word. That's not God's dream from Genesis 1 on. God has a different dream, and God is insisting that we are going to be part of it if God has to drag us in kicking and screaming. And you know what? That's good news. Because all we have to do, and you know it well, all we have to do is pick up the newspaper. If we're not reading about natural disaster, we're reading about political disaster and global disaster. We keep taking the hammer to that marvelous piece of art that the divine artist once gave. But here's the good news about today. Seventy-four years ago, in the wake of an earth-shattering First World War and in the midst of what we know as being the Great Depression, the Reverend Dr. Hugh Thompson Kerr of Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, dreamed his own dream. He dreamed a dream in which God was inviting all God's people to the communion table and called it Worldwide Communion. And they held that communion service for the first time at Shadyside Presbyterian Church. And it was so compelling for Christendom, for Presbyterianism, for the ecumenical movement, not only in the United States, but eventually across the world. It was so compelling that they all started coming. To dream God's dream again, that we could come together as a peaceful people, as a people who seek more than anything else to live out the original dream of Genesis 1. 
God said, you will go back to this table together, all of you, from the whole world. And you will see each other at the table this time. And you will dream my dream from the beginning. For this is what it looks like, words that you know only too well. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This morning, at this table, we do not just dream God's dream. We live it. We fulfill it with every fiber of our being. May it be so. Amen. Today's affirmation of faith comes to us from a 